Fifteen years ago, there was a war. Well, war has broken out here plenty of times before. They've tried to invade the Southlands through the Northern Valley time and time again. Luck was never on their side, though, and their victories didn't last long. They didn't realize that times had changed. Facing one defeat after another, losing territory and watching their nation dwindle, they built up their industrial strength to unprecedented heights and used it to wage one final battle against the world. That was 15 years ago. They fought ferociously, but were utterly defeated. The Belkins then committed the unthinkable. They used nuclear weapons on their own soil. Seeing this tragedy unfold before their own eyes, the victorious countries vowed to throw down their weapons. The world was once again at peace. And thanks to them, it seemed it would last forever. On a distant island, far away from civilization, the protectors of the peace take to the skies. Red alert! I was in the sky, trying to get the training team in my viewfinder from the rear seat of the lead plane. My pilot in the front seat was howling at the earth below. Give me a break. I'm babysitting nuggets up here. Command room to Wardog Squadron. We have leakers, aircraft type unknown. Crossing the border at Cape Landers, bearing 278 to 302. Captain Bartlett, your flight is the only group close enough to make the intercept. Baker, sense it. Go trail and stay close. The three of us will go hide. inside out. Sorry about this. The captain's apology to me seemed misplaced. One instructor had survived the fight but crashed on landing. The other one was killed in action high up in the clouds. It wasn't his fault that the unidentified aircraft fired on us without warning. Nor was it his fault that the low-altitude area where he sent his trainees was directly in front of the enemy. Eight people died because the command room had misplaced some zeros. That pilot in the number seven was amazing. Did you see her fight back? I couldn't bear to watch. Nagase, you keep flying like that and you'll die real soon. I won't die, sir. The only surviving trainee's voice was almost a whisper. Are you sure? You look like you couldn't hurt a fly. Her face was pale, but she still managed to smile a bit for the camera. The photo, along with my camera, was confiscated by base security. It was as if our little undeclared war never happened. I came to cover this remote island because I heard that a very unique squadron leader was stationed here. I didn't realize he was this unique, though. This bad-mouthed, good-natured old firebrand could take the greenest of rookies and forge him into a fearsome fighter pilot. Of course, that possibility vanished with today's encounter. The only crew he had left now were Second Lieutenant Nagase and the few pilots that happened to be on the ground that day. I know you don't like this, but we're short on people. Starting tomorrow, all you Nuggets are gonna be sitting alert. If we launch, stay glued to me up there. Nagase? Sir. 
You're flying number two on my wing. Gotta keep an eye on you, or who knows what you'll get yourself into. The whole affair with the unidentified aircraft was covered up. There was even a rumor going around that it was actually a UFO. Officially, the world was still at peace. Having witnessed the battle myself, I wasn't allowed to leave the island. Why do they even bother reprimanding me anymore? I know I'm gonna be stuck at Captain forever. Who do you think's covering up the battle? Listen, the only thing across that ocean is Murska Air Base. That's Yuktabanian territory. But haven't we been allies with the Yukes since the war 15 years ago? Yeah. That's why we got people working their asses off trying to confirm what the hell's going on over there. I bet they've got hotlines ringing off the hook somewhere upstairs. The government doesn't want to get the public riled up with all this, you know? But it doesn't matter. Soldiers like us are too stupid to think for ourselves, so we just gotta keep our mouths shut when they tell us to. I feel kinda bad for you, actually. <laughs> it's alright. I get to be with you guys. Captain's probably hating this more than anybody. Hmm? He used to have a lady friend over in Yuktabania. Ah, uh, that's just an old war wound now. This was the room, or the cell, I had been assigned to. Captain Hamilton. Unlike his superior, the base commander who locked me in here, he's been very reasonable with me. He even got my camera back. He told me that if his uncle wasn't a soldier, he would have liked to have a job like mine. Well, we don't have any reason to hold you anymore. What do you mean? Yuktobania just declared war. They've launched an offensive simultaneously, too. Our naval port at St. Hewlett is getting bombed right now. There were only three of them now. When the rescue chopper arrived, the captain was nowhere to be seen. The only thing they found was the retreating enemy intelligence vessel. This island used to be a place of exile from the rest of the world. It then became our first line of defense against the enemy. lead tomorrow I wouldn't waste my energy worrying about that if I were you <sighs> we're an auxiliary squadron you know so his highness the lieutenant colonel will just come down from the mainland and take over that's all Phew. I love this sound calms me down I'm gonna sleep well tonight I heard that the one who broke the captain's heart 15 years ago was a recon major in the Yuk army. Yeah, I did my history homework. We were allies back then. Man, the base commander sure wasn't being subtle about making accusations. <laughs> was there anything suspicious about the captain's behavior, he says. Hell, I'm more suspicious about the screw in his damn head. Ah, you're kidding me. An air raid? 
Give me a break, man. From the sky, the morning after. Pops came back like nothing had happened, as if the open sky had always been his one true home. Only 17 hours had passed since the war began. Yuk Tabania's war strategies seemed to be minutely timed to avoid giving Osea any chance to launch a counterattack. I got a notice of assignment as a member of the press corps. I guess Captain Hamilton had pulled a few strings for me. I didn't waste any time going to work. Second Lieutenant Nagase, inside the crew room. She is sitting by herself, writing something in her book. Nobody knew what she was writing. I realize these people may well be the story I was looking for all this time. In fact, I was sure of it. We set off for the northern region to refuel. This place is paradise compared to what's further ahead. Beyond our destination lies the closed gate to Nord Belka. Fifteen years ago, the Belkans set off seven nuclear bombs there to stave off the advancing Allied forces, entombing themselves in the frozen valleys to the north. That bit of history should have been enough of a lesson for us all. The seven Belkan cities near the gate were vaporized, and the local area is still highly radioactive. Our landing point was in the state of North Osea, formerly a haven for Belkans, but now entrusted to Osea. If you refer to it by that name, it's going to be local Belkan. He'll put a scowl on his face and tell you that this is South Belka. Higher Lark meant a lot to us. Our flight training took place here on this airfield. On the base, we were surrounded by junior cadets, eager to hear war stories. The newspaper article about us, written by that journalist Jeanette, made it here faster than we did. Somewhere along the line, we had become the most experienced pilots in the town. directed to take these inexperienced pilots back with us to Sand Island when we returned. Man, we better thank Pops for this. Why that? Because he's the guy who pounded basic fighter maneuvers into us. Now we can lord it over all these guys. You said it. These pilots had only a tenuous grasp of flying, much less mid-air refueling, so we had to land at every base along the way. I can't believe we have to send them off to guard the western coastline. The white bird rose up once again. Laser cannon in its wings. It was a moving sight. In my heart, though, I wished it didn't have to be used in war. None of them found out why the enemy targeted the base until much later. Of course, by that time, it was too late.
After my article, The Four Wings of Sand Island, was published to wide acclaim, I grew bolder. Here was a profile view of the base commander, the emperor of this base. Don't. He's in a bad mood today. If he catches you, he'll have your head. What happened? The Ark Bird. Huh? The White Bird in outer space, with Yuktabania outclassing us in firepower. It was the President's one trump card in the peace negotiations. And now, it's fallen right out of our hands. So you're saying we don't know how long the war will drag on? The Ark Bird. A superweapon capable of attacking from space far beyond the reach of the enemy. Its power generator was destroyed by explosives planted inside a supply shipment launched from Earth. Once again, the balance of power had tipped toward Yuktabania. General Howell, Supreme Commander of the Ocean Armies deployed to Yuktabania, successfully stormed the enemy beach and established a command center on the spot. The general, who claims to have been given full operational authority by the president, then made the following declaration. We will march forward and we will not lay down our arms until the Yuktibanian capital has fallen. Aured, the Ocean capital. The winds of war have yet to reach here. The air still smells of peace. But that wasn't us. By the time we got there, they had already... That's right. We heard them over the radio. They called themselves the 8492nd Squadron. 8492! 8492! Is that all you people have to say? There is no squadron in our military with that number. Damn it! What the hell's going on here? Despite the hectic mood among the staff at HQ, the start of the briefing was delayed. But the weary pilots, knowing full well that they must force their exhausted bodies back into the air once the order was given, weren't the slightest bit disturbed by the delay. Hey, what are you writing there? I just can't remember this next phrase. Here, let me see. Hey! The princess couldn't feed the dove that day. She was too sick. May I take a look? Rosgris. The demon of Rosgris got her, right? You know the story? The demon from the North Sea. I remember. My grandma used to tell me bedtime stories about it. And every time she did, I'd be too scared to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Ugh. Settle down, people. I knew a little about that famous legend, too. When history witnesses a great change, Razgris reveals itself, first as a dark demon. As a demon, it uses its power to rain death upon the land, and then it dies. However, after a period of slumber, Razgris returns. Me? The ace pilots who sunk the enemy submarines are right over there. And I'm the person you want to interview now? No, it's not that. It's just that I heard you used to be a fighter pilot yourself. I just fly freight planes for the maintenance crews now. The captain, Captain Bartlett that is, it was time for an old man like me to quit trying to compete with the young guys. Talk about a lack of respect. <laughs> Where did you meet Captain Bartlett? We were both shot down and we bailed out behind enemy lines in the last war. We got through the bullet-ridden battlefield and made it back to the Allied front line. I tell you, it was tough getting the army to believe we were on their side. Shot down? You two? Hey, it was a long time ago. Everyone makes mistakes, right? Oh, no, I didn't mean it that way. Even if you're not flying with those pilots, your age and experience provide a lot of support for all of them. I just wanted to tell you that. 
I have seen that you really listen to what they say, and you always have helpful suggestions for them. Well, thank you. I think they're all going to need you, now more than ever. I'll do what I can. These people, it's like they're walking on a tightrope that could snap at any second. They're going to reach their breaking point sooner or later. Yeah. She'd left her book in the crew room. A Blue Dove for the Princess. That was the title of the book she left behind. A favorite book from her childhood. The pages have torn off over the years, and she had been writing down the words that were on those pages, trying to remember every sentence and every verse. I love this book so much, but I only have faint memories of what was inside. I feel like I've grown so far away from everything since then. I remember how she looked when she told me that. I couldn't help wondering, did she choose to crash on purpose? rather than having to take part in the invasion of another country. When the rescue team found her, she was holding captive a group of soldiers who were sent in to capture her. Behind her was the helicopter crew that crashed while trying to rescue her. She had saved them, treated their wounds, and hid them in a safe place. I needed to rethink my image of her after this, after seeing her amazing toughness and tenacity. She even managed to obtain a little information from the soldiers she captured. It seems the people of Yuktabania were also beginning to have doubts about their leaders in the current war and word of Nagase's squadron was getting around, as the force that sunk two of their most powerful submarines. The Yuk army soldiers had nicknamed them the Demons of Raz Gris. She was obviously very proud of that when she told me about it later. Perhaps her pride was for Captain Bartlett, the man who had trained them, or maybe it was for her current captain. However, nobody in the upper echelons of her own army was proud of them. Bartlett was still missing, and that made his old trainees the subject of suspicion and criticism. Look at that wreckage. I'm amazed they're still making them like this. They? This looks like a standard fighter jet, but it's actually different. They've done a lot of things to reduce the number of parts and cut down manufacturing costs. Without sacrificing the plane's strength and performance. Very cost effective. You could make three planes for the price of two this way. Who's this they you're referring to? North Bosia Grunder Industries. Formerly the South Belka Munitions Factory. Run by the Belkan government. But Osia's taken over that land now. South Belkin technology is being used for Osea. Why does Yuktabania have this? Good question. Actually... <clears throat> speaking of Belka... Osea recruited some Belkin flying aces after the war 15 years ago to strengthen our air force. You know about this? No. Really? An aggressor squadron comprised entirely of Belkin aces. Our old enemy. Well, that's the rumor anyway. Even an old fox like me isn't sure they exist. I bet the current administration isn't even aware of the story.
The so-called impregnable fortress fell in half a day, and the momentum of the Ossian army had reached a peak. Its final stronghold lost, the Yuktubanian army was setting up a barricade in the urban area up ahead. The next battle could see a lot of bloodshed, with innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. However, the men and officers of the Ossian army were optimistic. They thought, as long as the three fighters from Sand Island were taking part in the action, things would turn out all right. They have become the center of the army's strength now. Would it surprise you if I said that President Harling is nowhere to be found within the capital? Not really. The hardline war Osea is waging right now hardly resembles the peace policy the President was promoting. Let me guess. He disappeared just before we invaded Yuktabania, right? Exactly. My journalist friends told me that nobody's seen him enter or leave the office since. All of his decisions are communicated through the Vice President. And it gets better. A lot of the military officers that resigned over disagreement with the President's arms reduction plan have started to return to the capital. I found out something myself. That Belkin aggressor force I was telling you about. Apparently, they're called the 8492nd Squadron. Also, and here's the kicker, Captain Hamilton, the adjutant base commander here, used to be assigned to the 8492nd. What? Oh, the back. There's no point in talking to that blockhead commander. He treated our president like an idiot just because he wanted peace. What about his adjutant, Captain Hamilton? Roger that. The captain and I will go see him. Grim, you go let Jeanette and Pops know. Right. Be careful. What? Nagase and the captain went to see Hamilton? What is it? Did I do something wrong? Let's hurry. You got it. We don't have time to warn the captain and Nagase. We'll have to talk to the base commander ourselves. Coming, second lieutenant. I was just thinking about calling you over. Me? Special Forces Second Lieutenant Peter and Beagle. Or I guess you prefer Pops. Fifteen years ago, you and Bartlett were shot down over enemy terrain. Bartlett's squadron HQ was destroyed. And all of its data was pried by Belka's magnetic pulse weaponry. When you made it back to the Allied front lines, it was Bartlett's word that convinced them that you were his squadron leader. Is that really true? Bartlett turned out to be a spy. So, who are you really? Can't prove anything about your military record. Can you?
Arrest them on sight. They're spies. Shoot them if you have to. Hamilton's got the base commander deceived, too. I punched that guy's lights out. That bastard was wearing a Major's insignia on his shoulder. I don't know who it is, but someone's trying to widen the rift between the two countries and keep this war going. If OC continues to win, then the war will be over. And they're after us to prevent that? You're kidding! You people are the pillar of morale for the entire Ocean army now. And now you know something you were better off not knowing. The President's disappearance. Listen, Pops, who exactly are you? It's no good! They seized our planes in the hangars! Hangar C in the rear probably isn't so heavily guarded. Yeah! But, over there, there's nothing but... We'll escape with my training jets. Good thing I maintain all my planes well, eh? Let's try it. Jeanette, you take the seat behind me. Captain Anderson, the man who commanded the aircraft carrier Kestrel and kept her afloat through countless battles. Nah, I'm just a guy who's fought one losing battle after another. However, since this war began, this ship hadn't taken a single hit from enemy forces. This ship may be unharmed, but it pains me to see fewer and fewer pilots coming back every time we launch them out on combat sorties. Now the only pilot left is Captain Snow, the squad leader. Nobody wants an aircraft carrier without aircraft. So we're just sitting idle here. At the end of the last war, I was assigned a mission of dropping a nuclear weapon on a city in my own country. Hmm. When I refused to win AWOL, it was Captain Bartlett who took me in. His nickname was also Booby back then. He was a strange man. Fifteen years since the war and he never got promoted once. In my country there was a group called the Grey Men. I'm likely to still be around today. To them? I'm a traitor, and for the past 15 years, Bartlett's protected me from them. Speaking of which, you don't think the Grey Men are involved with the disappearance of President Harling, do you? I've got an intelligence-gathering vessel in my fleet, the Andromeda, that's capable of intercepting all forms of communications. 
Recently, it picked up a secret message transmitted in Belkin. That, Colonel, is why I called all of you here. All this intense flying's tough on an old body. From here on out, it's their time to shine. Hmm. But what do we do about planes? We've captured a ship trying to smuggle aircraft from a South Belkin company into Yukdabania. Plenty of planes to choose from. When we got word of the President's return and ran up to the bridge, he was smiling and chatting with Pops and Captain Anderson. Apparently, he spent his days confined in the old castle, looking at the seven ground zero craters right out his window, which served as the border between the two countries of North and South Belka. In the end, the Ocean army couldn't take the Yuktavanian capital, and the war began to bog down. For Belka, who challenged the world to battle, but were crushed by the twin powers of Osea and Yuktubania. There can be no sweeter revenge. They had created the hatred between the two countries, hoping that the war would eventually exhaust them both. The military officials on both sides were playing right into their hands. The intelligence vessel continued to intercept the Yuktubanian army's communications. One message from Air Force Traffic Control contained a string of mysterious numbers. Latitude, longitude, a date and time, and one more set of numbers. The president had the answer. Well, how about that? These are the numbers of votes I won in my presidential elections. Huh, this is from the first time I won, and here's the number from the election two years ago. This message was meant for me. The coordinates marked a location within North Belkin territory. The date was tomorrow. The squadron from Sand Island became the president's personal air fleet, even as the official reports continued to state that they were shot down and killed. This was the new emblem. The president broadcast his voice repeatedly in an effort to reveal the truth to his citizens and soldiers. However, the central government, now run by the vice president and his generals, censored all of it, calling it enemy propaganda. And Yuktubania, their enemy, wasn't about to stop fighting either. The president needed to enter the capital himself with his marine force but that meant risking his life. As he boarded the helicopter, the president smiled and said, here goes. The third encrypted message from Bartlett came shortly after. This time, there were no coordinates. All it showed was a time and a radio frequency. At the appointed time, everyone gathered in front of the radio speaker. Hey, it's me! Get the wax out of your ears and listen up. We found Nicanor, the leader of Yuktabania, and we broke him out of prison. This war wasn't his doing at all. He had returned once more. He brought Nicanor, the Prime Minister of Yuktabania, with him. And surprisingly, he had brought one more person. A female recon major in the Yuk army. The one who broke his heart 15 years ago. 
it became clear why nobody could find him in the POW camps. The very first POW of the war, he had escaped before they could even get him into the camps. Yuktibania's situation was just like ours. Their leader, who espoused reconciliation, was imprisoned after a silent coup d'etat and the country proceeded to march right into large-scale war. What should I call you? Just Major. What's your real name? <laughs> All she did was return a smile. She remained faithful to the Prime Minister and to his vision of peace. And that faith had brought her here. She was carrying a single disc. She told us that the disc contained the secret plans of the Belkin Grey Men. So far, we have been unable to decipher the encryption code. The Solg, a military attack satellite that your country began building during the war 15 years ago, then abandoned in the peace that followed. The Arkbird was reborn partly to resurrect that dreadful star. Now, even after the Arkbird was destroyed, the Space Center's mass driver is still launching supplies into orbit. What is that star receiving from them? All hands proceed to battle stations. Yuktobanian fleet ahead. The enemy fleet contains 18 ships, arrayed in a battle formation designed to block our fleet's path. Attention, Yuktobanian fleet. This is Prime Minister Nikanor, representative of your government. I am on the... Uh, Kestrel? Yes, Kestrel. I am on the ocean carrier Kestrel for the sake of restoring peace between our Yuktobania and the country of Osea. We will once again... Attention, all vessels. The only thing that exists between Yuktobania and Osea is hatred. Prime Minister Nikanor has joined the enemy. Recognize him as such and seek the enemy fleet with him. But Commander, there's the Prime Minister talking. Please stand down. We don't know what we're fighting for anymore. Sir, please, cancel engagement and stand down. All our vessels loyal to the fleet. A traitor is blocking our way. Attack the frigate ship to go. Prime Minister, please take your leave. What? Go to our president and get a televised picture of the two of you together shaking hands. Show it to the world. Second wave of missiles inbound. Ten seconds to impact. Counter with artillery barrage. We can't hit all of them. Brace for impact. We've been hit by two sub-launch missiles! The ship's listening! Launch them out! We can't! The ship's listening heavily to starboard! We're sinking fast! Continue with the launch! What? Take them up! Hurry up with the catapult! Just concentrate on launching them! All hands not conducting aircraft launch, abandon ship immediately!
kestrel is gone. I've lost time and time again, but now I've finally won. Huh? Look, we launched them off safely. There's my victory. As long as they're in the air, I haven't lost. And I know they'll succeed. Yeah. The captain was humming a tune. The same song I heard from the anti-war audience in the stadium. He was the one playing that record in the middle of a sea battle. This is President Harley of the Ocean Federation. Attention, all Ocean and Yuktobanian officers and soldiers currently on the battlefield. Let us put down our guns and come out of the trenches. The Ocean capital of Alred has been freed of the people who took advantage of my absence to usurp control of the country. Once robbed of my freedom and of my ability to do the right thing, I now stand again under the light of the Golden Sun, and I do so with the Honorable Utobanian Prime Minister Nicanor by my side. We have resolved our terrible and unfortunate misunderstandings, and the war is now over. This is Prime Minister Nicanor. Head of Government for the Union of Yuktobanian Republics. Attention all officers and soldiers of Osia and Yuktobania currently on the battlefield. Please watch as President Harley and I stand shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand. President Harley's words are true. The war is over, but there is one more battle that still needs to be fought. We believe that those who have tried to stir hatred between us are now preparing a weapon that could wipe out half of all metropolitan areas in either one of our countries. Our comrades are in flight as I speak, determined to stop this plan dead in its tracks. Which country is under the threat of mass destruction? That we do not know. However, that is no longer important. No matter which country is hit, it would be a severe blow to all of us. So now I ask you, members of the military, if you see it in your hearts, please utilize the resources available to you and help out our brave pilots. Right now they are flying east to meet the enemy. To those who still dare to hide behind the power of their hateful weapons, bring yourself before the light of peace and harmony. witnesses a great change, Raz Grease reveals itself, first as a dark demon. As a demon, it uses its power to rain death upon the land, and then it dies. However, after a period of slumber, Raz Grease returns, this time 
as a great hero. Peace has once again spread across the world. The aces of Rosgris never flew in the skies of battle again. Above the clouds, there was only a clear blue sky, no longer in need of heroes. And perhaps, that's exactly what they were hoping for, all this time. and 
Will 